manufacturing software often looks very great in a sales pitch, but once you put it on the shop floor, it's a whole different story. I've been there. I've been there on the shop floor. I've been there in the position of an IT-OT system integrator and I've seen the same problems come up again and again. In this video, we explain why most manufacturing software sucks and we set the stage for how we do things differently. All right, so let's jump directly into the two major reasons so many solutions fail the day you roll them out on the production floor. Problem number one, most software is designed to be bought, not used. So what does it mean? Those software looks very shiny in demos. They are loaded with features. They fit all the check marks in the checklist with everything that you theoretically need. Big buttons, fancy interface, really easy to use, at least they look like it. And the management goes is, and is like, oh yeah, this is exactly what we need, empower our engineers. But in practice, they end up being slow, convoluted, and weirdly incomplete. So, for example, one of our customers has a very large SCADA system in a factory with uh, over 50,000 techs. So he paid a couple of millions for the SCADA system. And in theory, it has everything. It checks all the checkboxes on the checklists. But then in reality, the user couldn't even do a simple copy paste. So he needed to add tech names and they had everything in Excel, all the names. And now when he wanted to add it to the system, he had, he couldn't do the copy paste. Copy paste wouldn't work in the SCADA system. So he needed to manually type it into the SCADA system. So this is not only days and weeks of repetitive error prone tasks. It's also very much infuriating for the person who needs to do it. And it gets worse when you hit a technical issue. So I once spent, when I was a system integrator, uh, working with a big IoT platform, I had a technical issue and I spent hours and days with technical support. And this experience was just awful. So first of all, I had a call and there was a non-technical support person who was just doing like all the checklists. Like, oh, have you tried shutting it, uh, 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 shutting it down and turning it off and on again? Okay, I was like, okay, this is corporate. Let's, let's do this here for 20 minutes. And it took almost an hour and okay, came. Then this guy was, oh, okay, you seem to be have a real problem. Let me escalate this to the project manager. This project manager didn't have any technical skills. So what he did was just put some weird stuff in the ticket, totally misunderstood it. So in the end, uh, this resulted in a lot of going back and forth. So in the end, at one point, I just stopped replying to them uh, because I realized it doesn't make sense. Uh, it's already two days in and I haven't even talked to a technical person yet. It's just a waste of my time. And I think I actually proved their KPIs because they were able to resolve the problem within two days. They were able to close the ticket because you couldn't have this as an answer, like, sorry, you didn't close the ticket because you're incompetent. Uh, this doesn't exist. So, and also never open another ticket. So, yeah. so actually the KPI of them was really great um, because I never contacted them again. So, and no user tickets means no problems, right? So another pattern, don't get me started on those big features that turn out to be actual just system integrator work. Again, a couple of years back, working as an IT-OT system integrator, and we were there and we were evaluating products and it was like, yeah, this product can do this and this feature, really great. And yeah, once we selected one and then we start to realize it's not a product. He was tailoring everything 100% customized. I'm still up to this very day, not sure if he, they even had a product or if it was just a fancy word for a system integrator. It was really crazy because they did it so they could put all the check marks in the check boxes and in the checklists, fulfill all the features. But then because it's 100% tailored, you couldn't maintain it. Like there was no updates. I remember like uh, a year and a half later, uh, we were like, okay, can we maybe get those new, new features? Can we maybe do a product update? And we're like, yeah, mm, we can do it. Mm, mm, cost mm, 200,000 euros. And we're like, what? Why, why 200,000 euros? It, I thought it's just an update and then we realized, yeah, no, it was just 100% customized. So they check all the boxes on the, on the sales sheet, but then you're stuck with an unmaintainable mess. Problem number two, 
many platforms aren't built for power users. So they have this no code, low code, empower the engineer approach, everything's just drag and drop, it looks very nice. And then when you work with it, when you try to work with it productively, you're hitting a wall. Like the UI just doesn't scale. You suddenly want to add more machines and then you just have to grind through the UI and there's no fallback option, no code that you can use to dynamically generate it. So let's take Node-RED for example. Don't get me wrong, we are huge fans of Node-RED. It's a really great tool, but you need to know how you should use it. So it's really great for small tasks, to do quick proof of concepts, also to do quick things, small system integrator work, and also leave it in production. But as soon as you try to connect 200 machines or add advanced logics, it just falls apart. Like, look at those flows where you have, I don't know how many tabs open and you have uh, everything going weirdly around. At one point you just, you start with easy flows, but you don't think about ITOT best practices, uh, abstraction, dry, whatever, and it just scales. And at one point you just hire a system integrator who is like, what is this mess? And just start adding more mess on top of it so that in the end you don't understand it at all. And so you have those tools, uh, 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 and you still end up hiring a system integrator to work with it. One of my former work colleagues, he worked with a low-code platform. And it was, again, like all this empower the engineer to do it all themselves. But in practice, the engineer never touched it. I mean, at the beginning, they were like, oh, this is nice. Oh, we can understand it. But then, because the UI didn't scale and there were no fallback options, they hired then a 10-person system integrator team to do the integration work and they were trying to force fit it into the company's architecture. And on paper, everything was okay. It, again, it, it made all the t right ticks in the sales sheet, but then it, you couldn't work productively with it. So, one example. So when you integrate it with the company's architecture, you, you need to have some kind of APIs. And you could create an API endpoint there. And there was the option to do it in the UI, but there was no option to do it anyway dynamically and you could do it in the UI but you could not edit it or duplicate it. So what was the workflow of my former work colleague? He was just there and he just was spending 20 minutes and doing all the same steps again creating those API endpoints, then five minutes of testing and debugging why it didn't work or why it worked and then the remaining 35 minutes just sipping coffee and being so super frustrated about this whole situation and then repeating it again because you, he needed to do a change and now he needed to go through all of this 20 minutes UI generation again. So this project dragged on for months and never really finished. And you've seen this very often, all of these reports, these pilot traps, uh, how McKinsey calls it, where those digitalization efforts never really finish. Um, I'm very sure if they would have just used IT, some ITOT best practices, they could have done with half the team in maybe a month or something. Let's take a look at the Scala guy from the example before. Um, what was his work routine? Probably the same. 30 minutes of doing some crap work and then 30 minutes uh, hating himself and his industry and sipping coffee. Um, I would probably do the same if I were being forced there for, for hours, days and weeks with no end in sight just to do stupid repetitive work. And his boss was probably charging still the full amount for his whole time. So I don't blame the guy. I don't blame the Scala guy. I don't even blame his boss who was charging the full time for it. I'm blaming the manufacturer of the Scala system that they didn't have a copy paste button. Like, what is this? So it had all the check marks, but you couldn't work productively with it. So, and for some reason, this reminds me of this XKCD. Um, pause the video, go check it out in the article if you want to take a closer look. In the end, very often the system integrator is left up doing all the work and it's a bunch of manual repetitive ta tasks. So over time, naturally mistakes sneak in, project timelines drag on and costs skyrocket. So you might have even ending paying way more for this whole system integration than for the actual product just because the product wasn't built for power users and fell apart as soon as someone was trying to work productively with it. So to recap, problem number one, 
Typical manufacturing software is designed to be bought, not used. And problem number two, it is very often not built for power users and instead to look very nice uh, uh, to survive the sales pitch. So let me calm down a bit because I've seen these problems countless times when I was working on site in the factory. And every time I talk about it, uh, my heart rate just starts to go up. So this is eventually why we build our own company focusing on real ITOT best practices. But we dive into that in the next video where I have hopefully then calmed down a little bit. So thank you for watching part one of this three part series. Stay tuned for the next video where we will dig into fundamental shifts we've made. So things like open source, ITOT best practices and user first philosophy. So we can finally break the cycle of unusable manufacturing software. If you're curious, definitely check out part two and see you there.